All right, all yours. All set. All right, so I'm Terry Brady. I'm going to talk about prototyping with the International Image Interoperability Framework, or IIIF, which I'll, I'll refer to it that way because it's much simpler to say. Um, so I'll, I'll start out, I'll, I'll give you all a little bit of information about my background. Then I'm going to talk about what IIIF is. Uh, so I'll talk about the uh, particularly two APIs within the framework, the Image API and the Presentation API. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll do uh, a demonstration of uh, downloading, configuring, and rendering images with a IIIF image server. So about me, um, I'm a software developer for the Georgetown University Library. I've been telecommuting from Seattle to them for about three years. Um, and I'm the lead developer for Digital Georgetown, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in some of her slides. Uh, before Georgetown, I worked for LexisNexis for a number of years on metadata management and publishing systems. I worked for the National Archives and Records Administration, working on digitization systems and workflows. So we built software for corporations, nonprofits, government, and higher education. And I've been doing job work since 1999. So uh, I want to talk about uh, why at my university were interested in IIIF. So Digital Georgetown showcases unique digital collections and digitized assets from the Georgetown University Library. So this is material that's not in a published form anywhere else. Uh, so it's, it's kind of unique information that we provide and make available to uh, patrons on the web. And the IIIF framework promises to solve a number of challenges for our repository, and I'll explain those along the way. And we're enthusiastic users of IIIF, not, not contributors to the standard or the framework. So I'm really spending a lot of time talking about the great work that other folks at other institutions have done, and I'll describe how it's solving problems for us. So some of the problems as a owner or developer of a digital repository are some challenges that we face. So we need to provide low resolution versions of images for low bandwidth users to make sure they're readily accessible. But then for um, some uh, you know, image content that we have that's really high resolution, that's a value for particularly historical artifacts, we need to provide high resolution images for interested users. Also, we need to allow scholars to create citations to specific images that exist on the web and or even to regions of images. We also need to simulate the browsing of digitized manuscripts, so digitized books. Um, we also need to, uh, we have other collections that aren't in book form where we have a collection of items with no logical pagination and we need to provide a meaningful way to navigate from image to image. And we need to support the side-by-side -side comparison of historical objects. So the International Image Interoperability Framework was uh, founded in 2011, and I thought, I thought their website kind of gave the best um, definition of the problems that they're trying to solve. So they want to give scholars unprinted, an unprecedented level of uniform and rich access to image-based resources hosted around the world to define a common set of application programming interfaces to support interoperability between repositories and to develop, cultivate, and document shared technologies that provide world-class user experience in viewing, comparing, manipulating, and annotating images. So in the course of this presentation, I'm going to show you some tools that are um, available on the web that you can, you can actually try out. There's a number of um, uh, uh, libraries and other institutions that have made their content available in an accessible form, and you can try out uh, some of these tools. So the um, IIIF framework has four APIs, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe the first two to you. So there's the image API, which describes how to retrieve images or portions of images. Um, there's a presentation API that tells you how to um, display an image in context with metadata or other related images. There's also an authentication API and a search API, which uh, will, I think, get into some more complicated scenarios. Like with the authentication API, you can make low-res versions of images available, but then require authentication to see the higher resolution versions. So um, what do you need to use IIIF? You need uh, to make your images accessible to a IIIF compliant server. and there's a link to the website, they've got, there's a number of implementations available. You then create a, what's called a manifest, and that manifest tells how, how to present your image. 
And then you use a IIIF compliant viewer to read the manifest and present the content. So and the real magic of this framework is in the interoperability of the servers and the viewer content. So uh, the IIIF image API provides a rich set of options to retrieve an image. So you can specify that you want to retrieve a whole image or specific pixel coordinates. You can specify image scaling at the time you do your retrieval. You can specify image rotation. You can specify quality or color level to provide. And you can specify the uh, format of the image file that you want to retrieve. And all of these um, options are provided through the URL. So it's pretty, it's pretty nice setup. So the format of a URL to retrieve an image with the image API is you first specify a resource path then you specify the region of the image you want to retrieve, the size of the image that you want to retrieve, the rotation that you want to apply to the image, the quality level of the image, and lastly, the, the file format that you want to retrieve. So a resource path is some unique identifier that resolves to your specific image. And these image servers generally provide a number of different ways to resolve an image. So think of it as kind of a, a URI or some, some kind of unique identifier. The region component could be, say, I want the full image, or you can specify um, X and Y coordinates and then a width and height. And there are other formats where you can specify percentage rather than pixel ranges for your region. The next is you, you specify the size of the image that you want. So you can say, I want the full or max size image. You can scale your image to a particular width, scale it to a particular height, or scale it to a particular percentage of the original image. Next, the rotation allows you to supply a rotation of 0 to 360 degrees to rotate the image. And then you can also prefix that with an exclamation point to do a mirroring of the image from left to right. So number of manipulations that the image server provides uh, for you. For the quality level, you can specify that you want a color rendition of the image, a gray, a gray rendition, a bitonal rendition, or uh, typically, you just say default and you get the default value that the server returns. And then uh, different image servers are, con are configured to return different uh, image file formats. So uh, another thing that is a, a requirement of the IIIF standard is there's a JSON file that sort of describes properties of the image and properties of the services that the image server provides. So what I want to show you is um, the University College of Dublin has this map of the city of Dublin. And first I'm just going to retrieve the um, info.json. So this JSON file here provides um, some properties about the features that the image server supports so that the viewer software knows what it's able and not able to request, the types of formats that can be retrieved, some tile information for the size of image tiles that are available as you're building up uh, a rendition of an image, and uh, some size information. So this image that I'm going to load first is um, 13,000 pixels wide by 9,000 pixels tall. And it's uh, 36 megabytes in size. So here's our full image. And you'll see, um, kind of as I talked about, that format of the URL, we're retrieving the full image full size of the image, applying no rotation, default color scheme, and returning a JPEG file. So I'll click on it. And this will be slow to load. We may or may not wait for the entire download to appear. Uh, but here, we're retrieving the full 36 megabyte image. And I'm, I'm unsure if it's the download or actually the rendering in the browser that um, is slow. So that. We'll not wait for that to finish. I'll go on and show you some other variants of that um, image. So, to your question? Yeah. So are there servers or systems that conform to this uh, specification, like open source or closed there are. servers? Yeah, it, so if you go to the IIIF.io, uh, there's a, a server section where it lists about six um, implementing servers. We'll look at, um, in the later part of this presentation, the uh, open source um, Java-based solution called Cantaloupe. I don't think it's really meant for production use, but it's really easy to get up and running. So if you're interested in this, I'll give you enough information to actually go out and try it out on your own. So in this next image, inside that map of Dublin, there was a, a castle. 
and I'm going to retrieve the pixel coordinates of that castle from the image server. So here you'll see just uh, this uh, subset of that larger um, map file that I retrieved. So next, uh, what I'm going to do is show you that you can retrieve the entire map that's scaled to um, 800 pixels wide. So there, loads much faster. And then here you'll see the uh, castle. That was the image that we retrieved in the prior slide. We can also, instead of um, specifying a pixel size, we can supply a percentage. So this is 15% of the size of the original image. So, so bigger than that 800 pixel image. Uh, with the nice flexibility. So next what I'm going to do is, is retrieve that same 15% size image, but rotate it by 45 degrees. And here then we get the image uh, rotated. All right, so this image API, it's useful, but, but again, I'm going to show you the real power then is when you get into working with this with the interoperable uh, tool set. So we're going to look at, we're going to next talk about the IIIF presentation API that, that sort of tells you how to render that image in context and we're going to uh, look at some compliant viewers. So the, um, the presentation API allows you to present a, a single image or a collection of images and you assemble that into what's called a manifest. And the manifest uh, provides a sequence of images to display as well as metadata and other useful information to put that image in context. So the manifest file describes what is being presented. So that could be a book, a digitized book, or a picture. The sequence describes a sequence of images to present. And you can actually support multiple navigation schemes. So it's not just page one, page two, but you can provide alternative ways to navigate over a collection of images. The, the term canvas is what's used to refer to the image that you're displaying. And then there are a couple of other advanced features. So there's a notion of layering. So you can actually layer images on top of each other. And I'll show you, show you an interesting demonstration of that. And you can create what's called a collection. And a collection allows you to take a group of manifests and present that as a large unit. So um, I've got on in kind of the, the same, I'll send a link to the repository where I've got this presentation and all the uh, code associated will be in this repo. So included in that is a sample manifest file. And let me show you that in a little more detail. So here um, I've got a manifest file and I put some context related to our presentation. So I think we're doing a CJUG demo using a Dublin map from University College Dublin. I've got a little bit of a description and then uh, a little attribution that provides a link back to um, this presentation. So you've got, got a bit more information there. Um, you'll see the, there's a label for the image that sort of names it, um, some of the properties, the height and width of the image. And then here, we have a path to the actual image resource. And that path will start to look familiar. So there you see that. Um, image API formatted URL for the image that's been loaded in the manifest. So next then I'm going to talk about some image viewing clients. And if you uh, happen to click here, there's a list of available open source um, image viewing clients. Some may, be, some may or may not be open source. I actually haven't used them all, but uh, some of them definitely are. And one of them is called Universal Viewer. So this will take a IIIF manifest, render the contents. A nice feature that this project has is they just randomly go out to some cultural heritage institution and randomly load a manifest URL. So here I'm going to load whatever this is, and we'll see it in the viewer. So here are viewers loading. We've got some, a description of what's being presented. We have the ability to navigate from image to image. Um, here we're sort of simulating the format of navigating a book. Um, within the image, you can uh, pan and zoom the image. So here's where those components of the image API that we were looking at uh, start to come into play. Uh, 
So it's retrieving tiles of different size to create this really fluid um, navigation experience. And so here, so you remember I, I had showed you a sample manifest linked to that map of Dublin. So here I'm going to open up the Universal Viewer with the manifest file that I created. So here you'll see it's a you know, CJUG demo for uh, Dublin map. We can uh, click in, pan and zoom. Um, I've been able to add some attribution, so we'll link back to this presentation, as well as there's a metadata component where you can provide you know, limited or a very rich set of metadata. So um, this comes out, provides a really nice way to um, annotate and put in context images that you're presenting. All right, so the next one I want to show you, it's another, it's another viewer. This has uh, sort of a different purpose. So Universal Viewer was meant to just kind of display anything, be flexible, simple to use. Mirador is really meant for scholarly annotation and comparison of images. So I will open up Mirador. And it has this demo link on it. And by default, it opens up with um, two separate windows that allow you to um, look at some images side by side. So what would be particularly interesting is, um, and this first window is a little slow to load. Let me, let me load it. Oh, there we go. We got an object. So we can pan and zoom as we could before. Um, this is particularly interesting if you scan the same set of images with two different technologies. You can pull them up side by side and actually analyze different uh, properties or, or things uh, scanned with different spectrums of images. This also has a bunch of annotation tools that allow you to um, embed commentary and on a particular range of an image. And it then provides a way to cite to a particular region of an image um, if you're making some scholarly commentary on an image. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an alternative um, example of the AAA viewer. And then here's, um, they've got a, an advanced features section that I think is pretty interesting. So here we have a uh, um, digitized manuscript in which the illustration had been cut out. So it was digitized with the image removed. By activating a separate layer, I believe uh, this image, this um, illustration was held at a different institution, or it, it could be held somewhere else. But you can sort of reassemble the look of the original using material components housed at two different uh, institutions, but provide the viewer with sort of a synthesized view over the images. So that's that's some of the that's getting into some advanced features in the way you construct your manifest. So now what I, what I want to do is hop into like a little live demo. So I'm, I've got a virtual machine running on Code Envy. Um, I'm kind of, kind of new to playing with it, but having having a good time playing with it. So um, Code Envy also houses the Eclipse Che IDE, which is a um, cloud-hosted Java IDE, sort of a streamlined version of Eclipse. Um, and in there, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at Cantaloupe. So Cantaloupe is the uh, is a Java implementation of the IIIF server. They've got a pretty cool landing page here. So they've got a um, large view of the Andromeda Galaxy, a 6.2 gigabyte um, photo that you can drill into and sort of pan your way around the galaxy. So that's a, a nice uh, feature set. So this is being served up from Cantaloupe, I assume on a very powerful machine. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll run Cantaloupe on uh, port 8182, and then Code Envy will expose that, um, our server, uh, out to a public URL. And that's how we'll access the images. So when you're working with Cantaloupe, it allows you to um, create one of five types of image resolvers. So you remember we, we specify the, um, the resource identifier or the resource path for our image. And we can resolve that to a file system on the server. We can uh, resolve it to an HTTP server. There's an extension to pull uh, the images out of the database off of Amazon storage or Azure storage. And then if you need something more complicated, 
you can in Ruby write what they call this delegate script, which will interpret your path and I think allow you to mix and match multiple resolver types. And so everything I'm going to show you is available um, in the repo where the presentation is located. So we've got an installation script, so we'll, I'll show you the installation process, which is very simple. The run script to uh, get Cantaloupe up and running. Um, I'll show you the default server config that I've set up. And then we'll uh, take a look at some sample images. They're my dog, so we'll, we'll take a look at those. We'll build a, ma a sample manifest and then view that manifest in some of the uh, viewers that I presented to you. So here is the um, installation process. Essentially, we're going to um, navigate to an installation directory. We're going to wget uh, the cantaloupe uh, zip file from GitHub, and we're going to unzip it. And so that's, that's the installation process. We're then going to launch uh, cantaloupe. And the run process is essentially we, we specify a properties file that tells um, the configuration of your server, and then we'll essentially run a cantaloupe or file to uh, launch the server. So the default, um, I also, within Code Envy, I've set up a, a launcher called cantaloupe 3.3.2. Um, it's essentially doing the same thing as that run script I showed you, where it's going to uh, invoke the WAR file, and then it's going to um, expose a preview link with the public URL that uh, Code Envy provides. And so here is, um, I'm going to show you the uh, default, a couple features of the Cantaloupe config file that I've got. So I've got it originally set up as a file system resolver, and then we're going to go and reconfigure it to pull some images off of GitHub. Um, the file uh, system resolver right now is just uh, looking at a local path uh, for sample images, which happen to be cloned from the GitHub repo. And, yep. All right. So, so here we've got I've got three um, images of my dog uh, located on or stored on GitHub, and what we're going to do is we're going to um, install Cantaloupe. We're going to start the server. We're then going to um, open up the admin tool and change the image resolver. Just going to show you uh, what that process looks like. So we're going to go pull the raw image files out off of GitHub. We're then going to preview an image from the running server. We're going to then create a manifest, and I'll show you an, an online manifest builder tool that's available. <laughs> and then we'll view the manifest in uh, one of the viewer tools we looked at. So um, first thing I want to do is install Canalo. So I'm going to uh, pop over to Code Envy. And in here, I'm going to um, navigate to an install directory in the project. And I'm going to run the install script that we looked at. Terry, question for you. Yeah. So the Code Envy is a cloud hosted IDE, right? Mm -hmm. So when you run these scripts and commands, are you running them on your local system? No, I'm, I'm actually running these on Code Envy. Yeah, so on their file system. I think there is a way to serve up um, Eclipse Che. I just haven't had a chance to play with that yet. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of intrigued to see what that would look like. From your uh, experience having used uh, Code Envy, how is it like compared to, say, a client-side install? Or well, so I'm about a week into using it. Oh, so, okay. uh, and I just got a, a paid account just to make this demo easier. But I'm, I'm having fun with it so far. What I, my next challenge I want to do is the open source repository platform I want to work on. I want to try to figure out how to, how to build up a Docker file to support that. And I think that thing could be a really attractive way to onboard the new open source developers if we can say, here's everything you need to get up and running. So that's, that's, that's my goal with this next. Cool. Um, has, so anybody, has anybody else used code? Yeah, I've used it in the past. Okay. Like, like Cloud9. Yeah, I've used Cloud9 in the past. Yeah, it's similar. Cool. I may want to chat with you afterwards and hear more about your uh, experience. So here up in the Cantaloupe directory, we've um, unzipped. We've got a WAR file. We've got a Cantaloupe properties file. And now what I want to do is launch the server. And it's more convenient if I launch it with the launcher. Uh, the main reason is I don't need to go figure out what the uh, public URL is then for the site. So now locally on my computer, I am displaying um, 
an image of my dog here. But before, before we do any more with this image, I actually want to go in to show you what the code in the admin console looks like and make a modification. So I'm going to uh, go to admin. And I've already authenticated to this. But what I want to do is I want to change the resolver from a file system resolver to the HTTP resolver. And then I want to, instead of um, pulling images locally, I want to grab them from GitHub. So what I'm going to do is um, go to the same project but use the raw GitHub user content so it loads the, the raw binary files. So I will supply that as my prefix. Save the change. And now I actually want to go back to this um, image of my dog here. All right, so I want to show you then, uh, so we're, we're pulling in uh, lily1.jpg, so lily1 is, lily is the path we're using for the image. But we can do some of the same tricks that we looked at before with the URL. So I wanted, since I've got a color image here, I wanted to show you some of the other things you can do. So we can take the zero rotation and prefix it with an exclamation point. And then it will do a left to right mirroring for us of the image. Next, I can take the uh, default.jpg and change that. So default, it's returning color. Instead, I'm going to return a gray version of the image. And here we have it uh, rendered in gray. So that's a couple of the other uh, nice features of the image API that uh, you can use for manipulation. Uh, we also, uh, there's Stanford has created this um, interesting image cropper tool. So I'm going to um, take my original image of Lily, I'm going to paste this into this Stanford image cropper, load it. I'm going to just grab her head. And then it uh, puts on the clipboard for you a URL just to that region of the image. So again, that's using that uh, region component. Uh, so you've got a nice little way of um, creating a, a snapshotted region. And if your image server is persistent in its URL scheme, then you could actually reference image regions uh, using this as a retrieval mechanism. So the next one I want to do is show you um, a process of um, how you build a manifest. So I'm going to go to this, I'm going to uh, grab a path to um, a manifest for our Dublin map. So, oh, actually, I'm, I'm just um, indicating the source of where I've got these manifest files stored. So I'm going to go to the manifest editor. I'm going to um, open a manifest. Pasted in. Oh, okay, so I'm loading the uh, Dublin manifest that we looked at earlier. Open. And so here you get the same experience of the image viewer where you can pan and zoom, but you can actually see the metadata that was created. So here you'll see where I put CJUG demo using the Dublin map. Um, ultimately, you um, can define canvases, and that's where you name and add your individual images. But so now what I want to do is actually reference our cantaloupe. Images. So I'm going to create a new manifest. I'm going to um, go in and I've created a canvas. I'm going to um, edit canvas metadata. So I need to add an image. I'm going to reference the image. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the info.json file that we uh, talked about as a way of referencing. So I'm going to paste in our image server, pulling lily1.jpg info.json. All right, now lily is loaded. I'm going to uh, add a second image here.
usually I do use something to add in the image. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, and I'll add the third one. Pop in the third one. So then we can actually um, save this manifest and it'll save as a JSON file. I've actually already got it um, saved into GitHub, so I won't go through the process of posting it. So, but you need to then put that manifest in an internet accessible location. So I've been using uh, GitHub for those. But, uh, so we loaded the three images. Uh, we put them in the manifest so you can see what the manifest looks like. And then now we can open up the Universal Viewer application using that manifest file. So here we have the universal viewer, got uh, pictures, and we can zoom in and see Lily Snowshift with us. Uh, if you're interested in repeating this, I've got a little uh, video demonstration of the same uh, process I just went through that's there. So, so what are, at Georgetown, what are our use cases for IIIF? So we, we have a bunch of um, rare historical manuscripts that we've digitized. We want to provide a really good user experience in viewing those. We've used some JavaScript libraries in the past, and they work well if every page that was digitized was exactly the same size. But if there's any irregularity, which is common with historical documents, then it starts to skew and corrupt the image. So we need something better, and we think IIIF can solve that. We want to provide ways to provide high-resolution image viewing. Uh, we want to provide a way to view a collection of related images that may not be in a manuscript. Uh, so we, want to, some, we also may have images and PDF documents, and we want to contextually uh, relate those. Uh, we also have some objects described in an archival uh, description system, and we want to be able to generate manifests out of that system and render digital, digitized objects um, for our patrons. So the next thing, step we need to take is we need to choose the, the image server we're going to work with. So we're evaluating two open source implementations right now. We then need to determine where we're going to host our high resolution images. We, in the past, we haven't provided them uh, because they, were, they weren't easy to access and they would be costly to serve up. So we need to figure out what our strategy is going to be. We then need to um, prototype a manifest builder to pull metadata out of our digital repository, associate it with images, and build that manifest process. We also need to do the same thing for our archival description system. We need to then figure out how we're going to deploy and manage these manifest files. And then we need to calculate the cost of hosting high resolution images for user access. So we actually may hit a point where we know it's feasible, but then we need to actually secure funding to really provide as much as we want to provide. Uh, so if, if you're excited, there's a list of, they call it an awesome list of IIIF resources. It shows even more little tools you can play around with. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> you got any questions? Uh, Jim. I see you, you mentioned authorization. And I just wondering if you could spend you know, 30 seconds on how that works. You need to log in at some point, say a cookie or what? So I, I actually haven't played with the authorization layer, so I didn't talk a lot about it. I do know that the, one of the key challenges is how, how would you like, let a museum only give high-res access to subscribers or patrons or, or people who donors or something. So how do you have the capability to go higher and low res, but then control who can access that? So in the demos you showed, everything was just open. Everything was open. And there's a bunch of, so if you go to those viewer applications, they link you to kind of the world of, it's, you know, this is still relatively new, but 
they have done a good job of aggregating all the existing content that you can view with these viewers. You can kind of see the range of stuff that's available. Yeah. So the IIIF, uh, it defines what the API is? Yeah, so it says four APIs, that image retrieval API that we've looked at, the URL scheme. That presentation API is kind of that whole definition around the manifest. And then they've got the authentication API. And then they also have a search API for how you search within um, images with text or PDFs with text. You know if there's like a popular, like what, what's doing the image processing? Is there all the servers are responsible for uh, choosing which implementation of the image processing they would use? Is there a popular? I, you know, I don't know enough about the internals to know. Uh, so I assume since several of them are open source, they're using you know, whatever components they could get open source. I think some of the servers also have the ability to cache the tiles, so they don't need to recreate the tiles live. Uh, we've not hit the point of experimenting with that. That's, <laughs> that's something that would make our, our worries about you know, storage and hosting costs grow more if we were going to you know, pre-generate tiles, but it would make things retreat much faster. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much. Well, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, I guess while uh, Gabe's getting set up, if folks want to take a few minutes, take a, a break, go to the restroom, whatever, we get going in a couple of minutes. Not only have four slides, and the rest of this is a live coding exercise. So, uh, so I apologize for all the mishaps right now. Um, I do find this room very funny. It, it feels like I should be, well, we should be plotting a corporate takeover in here, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like all of us lining up and you know discussing how we can uh, how we should do a hostile takeover. Um, and then my screen locks. See, isn't that what popular news? Corporate takeover. <laughs> all right, so. Start with who am I? Uh, Gabe Bix, CTO of Dev9, uh, longtime job developer. Uh, so, why did I come to uh, Kotlin at all? Well, I've come to work in my career to the point where programming in my spare time is the only way to stay sane. Um, and once you get to management, you know, management's its own challenges, but it's certainly not as puzzle solving friendly as uh, programming is. Uh, and since I was uh, since I was 12 years old, I've been a you know, gaming dork of one variety or another. And I've built hundreds of not finished games throughout my life. And you know, here I am doing it again. And, so, and I'm like, why don't I do this one in Kotlin since I know I won't finish either. So I might as well learn a language while I goof around. So the why do I care slide. I, I like to have this up front for everybody because uh, it's yet another you know, JVM language. We've kind of been bombarded with them. It was about five years ago, I think there was a blood, maybe 10 years ago. The, only other time I've presented a CJUG, in fact, was for Groovy about 10, 10 or so years ago. Um, we went deep into Groovy, uh, and I, in the end, regretted it, not for the learning, but just for the uh, misuse of the language and, and the things that came with it. Colin's a little different, though. Um, it emphasizes safety, uh, nulls, finality by default, uh, ob you know, the object for singleton handling, um, or static handling, depending on how you want to think about it. Uh, it's a concise language, uh, which can be good or, or bad, depending on how you know you see it. In you can do things in a very tight way in Kotlin that you may not be able to do in Java. Uh, it's very interoperable. Um, it's on the JVM, obviously, so that brings all the JVM platforms. Uh, it also has a JavaScript transpiler. Uh, if you want to write your code in Kotlin, put it out on the web. That works just fine. And they're working right now on native compiling with LLVM. All of that means that it could kind of go in with the all things to all people aspect of at least the end deployment of Kotlin. So I also find it very easy to learn and use. As a Java developer, it is a little different. There's a few uh, changes to the idioms you have to work with. But really, it's something that pretty quickly you will grok, you will understand, and it, you will, you'll get the safety and advantages. That said, there are some edges on that easy to learn when you're working with Java, because it does, as a JVM language, has access to all the Java. Java loves nulls, and there's some uh, libraries that love nulls a lot more than other libraries. And that can be one of the areas where you end up with some very funky looking code as you're trying to dance around the fact that all these library calls want to push back a possible null. Sure, they don't push back nulls most of the time, but it can create some, some messes. I like to think of it as Java++, or more appropriately, Java Sharp. How many folks here have done C Sharp? Uh, so, and this is a question uh, I have to ask before before I go any further. How many folks have done Kotlin in, in the room? 
bam, I love it. <laughs> One half hand, I like that, that's fantastic. I went into a, it went into a presentation uh, about two months ago, and it was on Kubernetes, I'm like, well how many people are using Kubernetes in production? Three people didn't raise their hands, and it was an intro to Kubernetes course. I don't know what they were doing in the room, <laughs> but I knew my presentation was shot that very moment. So, I'm very happy you guys said that. So, the sort of canvas of features that are in there, I'm not gonna talk individually about all these, but it's got a lot of the features you would expect out of a Java-like language. It has some other really cool features that we'll touch on. It is a full-featured and you know, fully usable language. It is not a, an idiom-specific language, or if it is, it's object-oriented. Um, so it's not a functional language. Uh, you know, it's not a, it's not closure. It's not Lisp-like. It's not even really a, a language or language like Scala is. It's more of a practical mishmash of a few different languages. So let's get over to code time. All right. Uh, now I know you can't see that. There we go. Uh, tell me if that works. Okay, a little, is it okay to drop it maybe with a touch? That's still good back there? Yep, okay. And I have some, uh, some stuff here. We're just gonna go like this. All right, so starting off with our friendly blank canvas here. We'll kick in a new, pa a new package, and we'll call it a demo package. All right, pop up a new Kotlin file, and we'll call it uh, just demo, demo file. Okay, so first thing you note, um, Kotlin can be written straight into the package. Um, and in fact, the package name is not necessarily tied to the directory. So we can call it the banana, the banana package, it does complain, at least the IntelliJ complains when you don't do it. The best practice is to leave it in the same package. But just so you know, that's the way that works. Okay, we'll kick out a function. Note that the style here is a little different. Uh, I did that again. Sorry, guys. <laughs> there we go. Style's a little different. It is function, name for the fun for the function, name of the function, and then the name of the argument followed by the type. Everything in Kotlin is name followed by type. Uh, Note that there is no return, so you would think of that as a void return in Java. Uh, in Kotlin, that is a unit return. Uh, note also that it's unnecessary to have a unit return, but that's the type of return for things that don't return anything. All right, so we'll go off with a simple if case. So we'll go if a is less than 100. Um, Print line is just a built-in function imported with the default imports, and we'll just say. Okay, so so far nothing all that interesting. Uh, note when we run it, it is the banana package, even though it's in the demo directory. Get it over, and there we go. So nothing really interesting there, right? Uh, it's just an if expression. Well, let's take this if expression and, sorry, this uh, an if clause. So what's different here though is that in Kotlin, uh, ifs are expressions, so they return values. So we can rewrite a variation of this that is uh, a And let's go like this. Did it actually run? Yeah, there we go. And apparently I'm gonna have to do that every time. Sorry guys. All right, so there you go. What happened here was it, the expression for an if, when it's an expression, if there's one statement on the line or the last statement in a block returns. So if a else b, uh, this replaces the ternary operator, so this one took me a little bit of banging my head on it. I kept wanting to use a ternary operator. You can't do that in Kotlin. Um, it's just an error. Uh, it's just it's not a it's not an operator, okay. so it's it, you know it's a, just bad syntax, and it just tells me you know I'm doing things wrong. Uh, all right, so that's interesting and kind of a useful little way to, to play with it. 
Uh, I'm undecided on if that's dangerous or not. Um, a lot of the stuff in Kotlin, I, uh, I haven't yet got to the point where I've internalized whether or not it's really a good way to do things or not. But it certainly is a, a convenient way to express a ternary that I think is even a little, well, much clearer than Java's approach with a question mark and a uh, colon. So uh, let's look at another way, that, way to test things. Uh, another thing to point out here while we're here, uh, there's vowels and vars. Vowels are read-only right at the time of insta uh, initiation, in initialization, and read-only thereafter. Var is something that can be rewritten. Uh, obviously, you want to, in most coding, stick with as many vowels as you can and have vars only where you really need them just to reduce the chance of errors. But uh, they don't have a switch statement. They do have a when statement. So we're just going to say, And we'll do the same thing here. We'll run that again. Oh, shoot, I don't want I'm using the wrong key code. There we go. So once again, note it's a, an exact match. If it matches, if nothing else, if nothing matches, it falls through. You don't have to have that sort of odd uh, default casing you have in the switch statement. It's a pretty handy little approach to this. And importantly, um, whens are also expressions. So we can say we're going to convert a letter from a or from a letter into a value. Okay. Um, and we're going to give A's fifties, B's one hundreds. And we're going to say letter value. All right. So simple enough, uh, except I screwed up. So what do we do there? I'm just changing another character. Oh, sorry. Ah, no, this is good. This is something I, I need to point out as well. When, uh, when you're using the when um, as an expression, you have to have an else clause. You cannot have a no value in case. So you could have the else clause throw an exception or return a value, but that's just because uh, Kotlin would not know what to do with the result if you fall through the cases you have and pop them out. So there we go. Um, as you can see there, we got 50. All right, so that's kind of a handy little, uh, little tool. And there are a ton of different ways that you can use that. Um, but I want to point out one other thing that, we, that I've been using here and that is uh, string templating. Kotlin is also a language that has string templating built in. Um, it's the templating that can do the dollar sign followed by the value, immediately does it. Or if you need an expression in there, uh, you can put curly braces around it and do whatever you want with that. All right? So it makes sense? All right. So I will also say this is either Kotlin the good parts or Kotlin the parts that interested me. So I, I'll be fully, fully admitting that it's a very biased approach to it. But I want to point out one other little little string thing that is nice in Kotlin. Um, it does have multi-line strings. And multi-line strings are obviously handy in certain areas now. What's interesting with this trim margin is it trims the white space off up to the margin character so that you can do some interesting stuff with it. We can say uh, good news, bad news, and close that off. Pop it up. There we go. Simple uh, simple string working, simple multi-line string. Pretty handy. Uh, one other little point about this, with, and I'm going to jump back to the when real quick. Um, when can also be used for arbitrary uh, if else if then else constructs. So let's say val a equals 50. Um, if a is less than 50, uh, print line no. Or, uh, let's go. If a is is greater than 50, well, print line. Uh, 
the stability logs of Proto Tray. <laughs> All right. So, handy for those cases where you have very simple um, blocks of if else's that you want to deal with. It's a nice compact syntax again. It, it, it's a concise language, and I do appreciate that. No, you could also put blocks in here, but then the value and the complexity of the when can start to be muddy. I suspect, I suspect that's not a great idea. Um, again, I haven't gone deep enough into the language to see where people really put the, will put evil in the language. You know, I haven't worked with the whole team uh, pushing the boundaries of it. So, just a just an interesting thing to do. So, let's take a look at uh, arrays real quick. Um, basic data structure and We'll do a uh, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. Do a little simple array. Okay, fantastic. Note that int array of is important. Um, it anything with int array, float array, car array, actually returns a primitive array. Um, if you just say array of, it will be a um, unbox or a boxed uh, primitive if you, so if you throw primitives in there. So if you care about performance, which Obviously, don't optimize performance until the very last you know, possible moment, but if you care about performance, uh, realize that when you're dealing with primitives and arrays, use the, those variations of the arrays. So this brings us to uh, fours. So, simple enough. Um, looks very Java-y, uh, I in int array. Um, print out I. All right. Pretty straightforward. Nothing uh, particularly interesting there. I'm going to leave that int array there for a minute. And uh, let's do the same thing for where we go for C in. Okay. So we'll do the same thing, but there we go. Note that in the same way, uh, arrays are sequences that you can, or sorry, strings are sequences that you can go to each character and look at or play around. Uh, an interesting thing that they have also is ranges. So I think ranges for me are Python. I think that's where I remember using them. Um, but they are pretty handy if you want to do some quick plot, you know, planned loops. No ranges are inclusive. So including one, four, not the best thing if you're going to be walking an array and you forget the, uh, the you need to be zero to, zero to three. Uh, but there it is. Um, no, another interesting piece, though, is you might expect this to work. It does not work. It does not work. Ranges are only uh, in increase, they only go in increasing. So they have a down to method. Well, we'll get, we'll get to why it's a method here in a minute. And it does that. You can also do some interesting stuff for one, uh, let's go two to 10 in steps of two, all pretty pretty good ways to do stuff that might be a little, a little painful otherwise. Um, let's combine this one with uh, one of our earlier things. We'll just do a really quick function to do um, even odd, or we'll go So, take and walk that so you can see our leveraging our when syntax. Crank it through that. Very straightforward, right? So it starts to it starts to combine in, in kind of cool, powerful ways. So that was the basic control flow. The rest of control flow works basically as you would expect it to in Java. I don't touch on one of the more complicated pieces of control flow. If you get into language, they have a more complicated jump and labeling system, um, a very complicated jumping and labeling system that you can get into. Uh, since I avoid them like the plague in most of my programming, uh, I didn't really dive too far into it. Um, so just know it's there. and know that you should probably be aware of it in case you run into that kind of code in the wild. So let's do a little bit of equality. Uh, because its quality is different than Java's. We're going to do a list of strings with only a blue element. We're going to do two of those. And we're going to do uh, 
types. We're going to have a third one that is the same in the same reference as the first one. So, what are the ways that this works? First off, S1 equals to S2. This is the same as saying dot equals in Java. This is a object comparison. So, second one around, uh, obviously we say S1, sorry, equals equals S2, uh, and S1 equals S3. The, the trip that only equals is a referential equality check. It doesn't check anything else. So, as you would expect, the first one is true because those two are equal down to their elements. The second one is false because they're not the same uh, reference. And the third one is true because they are the same reference. Pretty straightforward. Any questions to this point? Everyone just wants to go home. Yeah. I got a question. Yeah. On the last slide, you were doing ranges. Are those only signed or unsigned numbers? No, you can do uh, characters and ranges. Uh, you can do, with the step function, you can do uh, floats in, in ranges as well. Um, all right, so let's jump forward and just do a couple of functions and do some interesting stuff with functions. And I will kill this. I'm going to use it for something, but we'll do that later. All right, so we're going to take and build a simple function in this package. Note that these are package access accessible functions. So right here, right here in this, in this function means if you just do banana dot whatever, that is a, the same effect as sort of a Java class with a static method on it, but at a functional level. And the way behind the scenes this is done is a class is built for the package itself that has these uh, methods inside it. So let's just build a simple sum function. We'll go A plus B, very, you know, very complicated programming we're doing here. Um, And we'll go five, four. All right. Very complicated, right? So let's do some interesting stuff, though. One, uh, this is a really simple function. And there are a lot of simple functions you'll deal with. So they have the idea of single line functions, where you can simply go like this, and it will return out. There we go. Does that make sense to everybody? So very simple way to deal with one-line functions that aren't very complicated. Um, same behavior there. One other interesting function thing that I want to show, though, uh, is we're going to write a simple power function. All right. So it's an infix function. And this demonstrates quite a lot of interesting little aspects of the language here, actually. So and instead of var we'll do value, and instead of hiss we'll do this. All right. Okay, so it makes sense what's happening there to anybody? Is that want to show? I'll, I'll show this obviously, but at the basic, we're using our range note. Our range can be from a variable to a variable or from a constant to a variable. Yeah, George. So in in this example here, who who can see the POW method? Anyone who has int. So that was the other piece I was going to. It's a good question. Um, uh, actually, what's the what is the term for that? Uh, you can you can apply methods to other existing classes. Um, like an extension method. Or? Extension, yes, extension functions. Right, and all together now. But, <laughs> but you get into chaos if you don't have namespaces. The, yes, there there may be chaos this way. I, I'm not. I, they're imported by the package. Yeah, they're imported. They are imported by the package. But you could you can get into chaos in in this path as well. Um, I'm not advocating for or against extension functions necessarily. Uh, mostly against, I've, I've done some terrible, terrible things in Ruby in the past that I, I'm not proud of, nor will speak of, but um, 
but it is, a, it is a feature of the language. The other one is the infix notation, which is very nice for, in fact, you've seen infix notation methods now multiple times. Step and down to are both infix notation <laughs> methods. So let's do this one again with pow. It's actually four pow two. So we would expect that to pop out to 16, and sure enough. So what goes on there is the infix tells it to take this as the int that you're working off of, and the thing on the right side as the parameter to uh, the infix. Other than that, it's all stuff you've seen before. So an interesting, interesting element, and they leverage it inside the uh, Kotlin API. I actually like that you can go into most of the source code for this stuff and actually see how they do it, and they're leveraging the language to do it. So it gives you good ideas for at least how they thought of uh, implementing the stuff. Um, so I want to point out one other thing that, uh, again, I, I suspect George and uh, some of us who've been in C++ hell may uh, have some mixed views on. It does have operator overload. You can overload operators, and some of the simple examples are, um, let's just do name equals uh, oops. All right, so simple enough. John Smith, right? Um, that's not a very interesting thing because Java also does the same thing. What is interesting, though, is you can click on that there, and it will take you to the public operator function on the string class that takes other any and returns a string. So you can see that they're dog, they're dog fooding their operator overloading. Um, the other thing we can do with the string because of this, because there's another operator overload on it. Um, oh, sorry. I am six. Oops. And this is why. I, All right, so there we go. Uh, you also have an operator overload for the traditional array uh, accessor for getting into a, and getting into a string. Um, all right, any questions so far? So yeah. That, yeah. That, uh, overload operator, did they use the plus character when defining it, or is there something magic about the name plus? There is something magic about the name plus. Uh, oops. You declare an operator followed by the name plus, and there are a series of names you'll find on there. There's uh, anywhere there's there's a name one that's connected with operator. That name then then becomes special and becomes connected. So, so there's a, a fixed set of operators you can't you can't just create a new operator. You can't create a new operator, and the operators behave they they behave as, as you would expect them to for that operator. That of course doesn't mean that you know applying an operator to something odd will necessarily make the code behave the way people expect it to. So is there a definition of plus somewhere else, or because they, they don't say what it does there? So you know, if I add, if I use plus on some other types, how do I tell what it actually does? That's the operator, uh, the operator overloading nightmare, right? I mean, it's it's your choice to what plus means in the context of your object, and that's why, uh, it, in fact, one of the one of my great suffering experiences with Scala was using the Lyft framework back in the day. And uh, I, I think they just wanted to use every possible character on the on the standard English keyboard, um, and not all of them made any sense. In fact, most of them were just you know squiggles, right? So. Right, but I mean, this this doesn't have code that actually implements plus for, for strings. No, it doesn't. Uh, but all it is is concatenation. You can see in the in the Java doc it says concatenation right there. Right. So if I were making my own class and I wanted to implement a function of write plus, then I would just write it. The rest of the string definition here. Yep. You just put your Cruise own brace, curly brace, and, and yeah, that is a, that is it goes. Yep. Okay. All right. So we're we good so far. How are we doing for time? Um, we got about twenty minutes. All right. Twenty minutes. Maybe we can wrap up early. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks. It's been a long day. Total total <laughs> vote of confidence there. Um, all right. So. Uh, Let's go through and take a look at a couple of other things. Um, oh, 
I would like to show uh, one uh, one aspect of the collections is fairly interesting. Um, set, map, and list are all immutable. If you want a mutable version of that, you have to declare a mutable version of the list, at which point it behaves correctly. That's uh, important. No one has tripped me up a couple of times, but it's just good practice in general. Um, all right, so let's talk about mutability. No, sorry, uh, nullability. Um, by default, everything in Kotlin is not does not allow null. So we're going to call name a here, and we're going to say, "Hey name a, null." Uh, right off the bat, though it's probably not easy for you to read, null cannot be a value of a non-null type string. All right. So by default, vars and vals do not allow nulls in them at all. Um, you can, uh, if it's needed, put a question mark on there. Now it is effectively an optional, an optionally null object. All right, simple enough. Uh, so if we have this optionally null uh, character here, uh, and we want to leverage it for something, say we want to know the length of the string further on, we're going to say if uh, actually just go isn't. All right. Okay. Well, there's a problem here because a is potentially nullable, and it's going to tell us that. So we can tell it to, we can tell it to do that, and it's going to say, "Oh, well, that's an even bigger problem," uh, because now it's a possibly nullable boolean. And what the shift is when you put the question mark there, it says either give me the value or a null. So that's a problem, or we can do that. And that little Elvis oper operator basically says, if the, if the preceding value is null, then the value that, I, that comes after, after is the value that we want to use. So a simple way to deal with, with nullability, like I said, when you get into some Java libraries, especially some that are kind of poorly written, you can have just null soup start to invade things. What if you are just willing to take the chance that it's a null pointer and you're, you're just going to run with it? In that case, we can run this, and we can say that means throw no pointer. I don't care. I understand the risks. Just do it. Um, and uh, I did find myself in early Kotlin development just going, you know, damn it, fine, throw nulls everywhere. Uh, that was that was a bad a bad sort of you know allergic Java reaction to being forced to deal with nulls everywhere. Um, that's the basics of it. The only another another little interesting piece on nulls is that collections behave the same way. So we'll go back to our name list again, and it's a list of Ted, Sue, and Null. Okay, nope, can't be done. It can't be done because you're not allowed to have nulls in a list of uh, without the little question mark. So inside the generic, if you say that, it says, oh gosh, that generic allows nullability. This list is, uh, this allows nulls in it. So another important thing to do in there and to note, uh, Kotlin really, really hates nulls. And it's for the best. It's like having the optional be an enforced uh, practice of it. Question? Yeah? You showed the little uh, question mark colon as being sort of the what to do if something was null. Can you chain together a bunch of stuff like uh, if, if you had list question mark so that names could be null, and then you would have names uh, indexed by one dot some function dot length. Yeah, so we could do so something like this. Um, so uh, start with that. No, right off the bat, it's complaining about that. 
what I was curious about is if you could write a statement that had multiple question marks in it you and can. one question mark colon at the end. Uh, so there's names. Uh, so one other way you could do the previous statements using uh, some have something that might be null and you want to call a function on it, and that might return null and you want to call a function on that. And yep. You want to call like three or four levels and, and any of them are null. And that's exactly what you can do. You can chain as many of them down there and you can, after all of that, uh, do that as well. So again, that whole thing will collapse down to a null if a null is detected in that chain. Um, so yeah, it, it will behave like that. So I'm going to try and run through this uh, next step fairly fast and that is on some of the object oriented aspects of this stuff because really all I've touched on right now is sort of the uh, functional, well, the procedural sorts of uh, portions of it. So let's go with uh, a simple class. Uh, we'll call it an address class. Okay, that is enough. Uh, oops, I don't want that in there. Yeah. All right, that is enough for class to exist in Kotlin. Obviously, uh, not a very useful class at that point. Um, let's throw in that right there is a default constructor. The default constructor has a value in it, which is actually a property of address that is read only and needs to be initialized inside the constructor. All right. All right. So let's throw a couple more in here. Let's throw. Uh, <laughs> throw in city and state we have something like that that's interesting, that's all well and good you probably put some more uh, functions in there um, but one thing you may also want to do is treat this as a data class a data class is most similar to a struct in C++ uh, kind of I, I actually shouldn't even say that um, or C, but it's just a bucket of data. It has a couple of nice properties to it, um, one of which is the two string. So if we create a data class, it doesn't need any implementation at this point for us to have a decent little two string on it. So let's create a new address. And we'll do I'm going to spell value because I can't spell things. And, uh, right. Okay. So there you go. You can see that by default, it has a nice little constructor or nice little aspect there. It does another very interesting thing, and that is it has a copyability that is fairly handy. So we'll go address two is a copy of address one, um, where, uh, state is Oregon. So notice I just threw out one other thing for you there, which is um, name parameters. All, uh, all functions in Kotlin have name parameters, so you can access the list either as, a list, as the standard approach to function calls, or you can do it as name parameters. Um, very handy for these kind of uh, Quick built little things, you know, mainly used for data transfer objects, that kind of thing. Question? So that first constructor, if you want to do line one and city and state. No, sorry, this, yeah, and this is a little misleading. These little line ones, these city and whatnot, that's actually IntelliJ just chucking that in. Okay. Yeah. Question. Um, on address two, is that actually getting a reference to address one or is that actually copying? Nope, it creates a brand new one and it passes in the arguments uh, and you can override any of the, any of, so it copies the ones for, it copies each of the fields from address one and you can override any of the copies in, in the middle. I can think of 10 or 15 times that, uh, you know, that I've used this sort of thing and would have loved to have this feature. Uh, that said, I mean, it's got all the same problems you just generally have with copy stuff. Be aware of references, uh, you know, issues with that. Get yeah, George? Is there a dot JSON method? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, anyone else know? I, 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 I believe there is right now. Uh, 
Which actually, it's a, it's a mildly terrifying question, too, though. Yeah. <laughs> so does it also create a hash? Uh, yeah, it equals, yeah, equals a hash. Um, and it has one other thing I want to get to, and that is destructuring. Uh, it does destructuring, what do you call it? Destructuring uh, properties. So, you familiar with this one? Yeah. All right. All right, let's go like this. So, the idea is that we want line one, city, and state all in, uh, oops. We want all of those uh, for use in our local library, local space. So we take that. Uh, all right. So what that does is that pulls out uh, from the object that has uh, destructuring uh, properties on it the ability to in one line, pull those out into variables. I was very excited by that. I thought, oh, that's very cool. Uh, but it is based on position, not on name. So, oops. so you should be very careful when using this that you know the position. Uh, IntelliJ is friendly enough to say, hey, uh, city's probably in the wrong place. City and state are probably in the wrong place because that name sure looks like those names are different, but if you did A1, A2, A3, or some other you know sort of variable naming, you can shoot yourself in the foot with it. A better use of this is in hash maps. Uh, key value comes out as you would expect key then value, so you can do four key value in map, and it will iterate through the the that. All right, and I can show an example of that if you want, but uh, I think it's it's pretty obvious. The thing I'm going to finish on. Uh, is a tiny bit of inheritance um, and delegation, because uh, I think it's actually some pretty cool stuff. All right, start with that again. All right, so we're going to have an interface for a named object, and we're going to say first name and uh, last name. Okay, all well and good. It'll have a function on it for a full name. And there we go. Not, uh, not particularly interesting, uh, but to note it's an interface based thing. There's no multiple inheritance. Uh, inheritance should be along the same lines as Java, where you have a base class, just a like base class, followed by as many interfaces as you need to, need to implement. Uh, can the function in the interfaces be an actual implementation? like the default functions in Java? I believe there's a default function equivalent. Okay. Um, I, again, this is where now you're pushing on the bounds of where I've been forced to dig. So, um, all right, so let's, let's go for a person class, which is a named, uh, a type of named class. All right, so we'll implement those constructor parameters. There we go. Note that even in the constructor now, those are overrides of this. This brings up an interesting point um, I, I should mention is all classes by default are closed and final, or well, final, which makes them closed. So there is no uh, subclassing unless you explicitly say open in front of it. That allows it, which uh, that allows you to subclass it. That comes with some problems, uh, especially around test frameworks, especially around older test frameworks. If you want to, you want to use them against this code. Uh, what's the uh, what's the my, Makito, right? Makito, old Makito basically said, I don't deal with finals at all. You know, you you're on your own. So uh, that's still a problem here. Okay, so we also want to implement uh, full name, and we'll just do this with uh, our friendly string implement string interpolation. Okay, all well and good. Uh, For whatever reason, Ted's on my Ted's on my brain as far as names go. So, uh, and we'll say okay. 
nice and simple, nothing particularly interesting over there. Also, if you don't say override on a function, uh, it will yell at you if you're overriding something. It's not allowed. You have to explicitly override even from interfaces. Okay, so that's that's all well and good and not particularly interesting for anybody, I would imagine. But their delegation piece actually is pretty in interesting. We're just going to create a delegated person here, a uh, delegated name. And it is going to be it will take a person and it is named by Okay. Oh, do do Oh, private. There we go. All right, so we have a property on here. Uh, the property is a person. It implements the name to interface, but it is implemented by P that we passed in person. So behind the scenes, it's doing a delegation to that object. So every public myth, every public aspect of the interface is supplied by P. Does that make sense to everybody? So if I want to do the same thing here, I can now go down to here and I can say, well, DP equals, uh, oh, it's DN, sorry, uh, delegated named and taken the P. Okay. Fair enough. Nothing particularly interesting there, but it is pretty nice if you're going to be using a lot of interfaces and you have a complicated class that is perhaps delegating to some objects. It's a very nice way to do that. Let's do uh, an override on here. And we're going to override full name because on our delegated version, it's important uh, for us to return last name first. There we go. Just overrides it, hides the delegate if you actually implement it. That is my 30-minute uh, primer on Kotlin. Uh, I hope it. Oh, good. Um, what's the separation if you want to do multiple interfaces? I don't know. You want to try it? No. Let's. Uh, let's okay. Now we're on off script. So let's uh, let's see what happens. Uh, what's another? What do we got in it? Let's have a uh, interface aged. Okay, fine cheese. Um, uh, okay, and then we'll have a we'll have person also implement aged. Okay, so sure enough, uh, it'll be thirty seven. All right. There we go. Uh, now what we want to know is can we then do uh, so that works. Now we'll be more, I think what we can do then is we could actually have a separate one that was implemented by a different delegation. So you can do a pretty complicated delegation strategy. This is probably one of my two or three favorite things about the language because I don't know how many times I've gone through and been really working on a program and delegation is really the best answer for complicated interactions and, and destroying class hierarchies. And gosh, it's a mess in Java. It's just, it's big and noisy. And you can use some of the, the sort of bytecode manipulators to hide and, and do this stuff, but that's like creating a little sub-language on your Java. So, you know, for better or worse, it's there. And any other questions? So that's my introduction to Colin. There's a lot more depth to every single one of these things. Um, I had to pick and choose because I, I knew this wasn't, you know, an hour and a half of me typing in front of you guys. Uh, Probably for the best, um, but it really is a good uh, a good tool, an interesting language. I I'm personally interested in it as an actual potential for using things. I used Groovy and found that gosh, that was a hard language to have in production. Um, this doesn't feel like it's a hard language to have in production. In fact, it feels like Java, but with a little more safety, which uh, a little more safety and a little more uh, you know sort of readability and conciseness that is quite nice. Yes, and does uh, oh that's yeah it's another good point. Support for Android on top of all the other uh, sort of we can deploy anywhere approaches. You sound like you use Scala also. I've used Scala. I, I will not claim to be a Scala expert, but yeah. But so how would you compare Kotlin to Scala? It looks like it's got a lot of the same features. It does. I just find it a lot more usable. A lot less. A lot less. Not usable is not the right term. Uh, a lot less difficult to get into and to start using quickly. 
Um, colleges, scholars, scholar just felt very complicated, very heavy. It had some really cool features, um, but those edges are those edges are sharp. The edges here aren't particularly sharp. It's a pretty easy transition if you're a Java developer. Probably a pretty easy transition if you're a C sharp developer as well. So if you got a mixed mode team, that's another area this might be really helpful for. Any other questions? How widely? How widely is it used? How widely is it used right now? Uh, I don't really know. It's a, it's a new language in the last, what, 18 months? Um, so I don't think it's that widely used. That said, Google dropped their sort of booyah Kotlin thing, what, six months ago and kind of shocked the, shocked the whole community. Um, and Spring 5 is, uh, has said they're going to support it as well. So we're seeing a lot more support on it. And it has a tool vendor behind it that is passionate about it in the JetBrains things. That said, for you Eclipse folks, they do have an Eclipse uh, plugin. Um, they realize that you can't alienate, you know, 10% of the job world. <laughs> Sorry, no, that's, that was really for a name right. He and, he and I like to poke, poke each other with the uh, IDs. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I find it to be a, a good, clean language. That said, adoption of all the JVM languages always makes me nervous because I've seen people try and implement Scala and run into the, I don't have any, um, I can't find anybody who can actually do it and it's hard to train. I've seen people do all sorts of language things in their organizations and honestly, one of the best parts about Java, there's a whole lot of us that do it. And so if you're an organization and you want to bet on something like this, make your bet knowing that Kotlin at least is not a hard move for someone from Java and has all of that background with it. Uh, it's a little tougher when you talk about closure and things where the paradigm is different enough that JVM language be damned, it's a much harder place for someone to move from and to get off the street and up to speed, which is important to companies. It also has uh, uh, IntelliJ will actually read Java code for you too. So if you like copy and paste the Java snippet to IntelliJ, it will to Kotlin It will, and it's, it's a pretty cool feature, but one thing I thought was really uh, weird about that when I first did it was it's not a great way to learn how to do Kotlin. Uh, in that if you take a complicated Java file, it does a computer's job of converting that file. And then you're digging through and going, why would they do that? <laughs> right? Now, if you, if, once you know Kotlin, you're like, oh, yeah, I'll just move these things around and make it clean. But yeah, it can be kind of brutal. But it is a cool feature, and that's, that's how I first did it. And I was, uh, I was trying to learn a game, uh, a game library and Kotlin at the same time. That was not a good move. So, all right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, Gabe.